YouTube family, welcome to another episode. Smash like, subscribe, and the notification bell as we take a stroll through the European game. Vamos! The Serie A season is still young, and with all 20 teams having already dropped points, it already has the makings of being another down-to-wire affair. So what have the first few match days taught us? And with the World Cup right around the corner, defending champions France are dealing with a controversy involving blackmail and a witch doctor? Sacre bleu! While in Spain, Real Betis have come out of the gates flying, while Sevilla hover just above the drop zone. Can Los Beticos load it over the bitter rivals for the rest of the season? I'm joined by Jonathan Johnson and a returning friend of the show, one of the voices of Paramount Plus's Serie A coverage, Dre Cordero. The Diego Lasso Continental Roundup begins right now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Keo Lasso. Thank you so much for being part of the family. YouTube.com forward slash Keo Lasso. We're pushing on to 25,000 subscribers. Help us get there. Thank you so much for your support. Jonathan Johnson, how are you, my friend? Yeah, doing very well. Thanks. And yourself? Good to be back on. Good to see Dre again. So uh, looking forward to, uh, to picking over the weekend's action with you guys. Absolutely. Fantastic to have uh, Dre Cordero back. How are you, Dre, my brother? Thanks, my man. Always uh, appreciate the invite. And uh, I, I miss the days when uh, these little interactions with JJ were like a daily thing when I was covering uh, League On. Uh, we moved on to City, yeah, so it's good to catch up here. Absolutely. And, you know, you can you can chime in with Liga anytime you want, Drake. Yeah. You're always welcome here. But welcome, everybody. Welcome to the show. As we mentioned in the intro, this is our Continental Roundup. No Premier League chatter allowed here. Let's talk about the rest of Europe. Let's begin, of course, with Serie A. Serie A. Listen, it's been exciting per the intro, uh, Dre Cordero. Let's begin with you. We had a few predictions uh, before the season began. Some have gone yeah. our way, some haven't. Give me your takeaways from Serie A so far. Yeah, that it is um, it, that it's going to be every bit as entertaining as it was last year and maybe with more teams involved in the title race. I think the, the one thing that really stands out early on is that there's no clear singular favorites. Um, all the, the top teams that have played top opposition have taking points off each other. It happened, uh, Napoli and Fiorentina shared points. Uh, Milan and Atalanta did the same. Juve and Roma just canceled each other out. So um, Napoli, who looked really good the first couple of rounds, we thought well, maybe we were underestimating Napoli. Uh, then they dropped points in the first sort of real test that they get uh, away to Fiorentina. So I think it's going to be just a delightful campaign. You've got the uh, European element. You've got a World Cup smack in the middle of it. So a lot of it will be sort of left to chance. But for out of the gate, there are six, seven teams that are very difficult to separate. In fact, the top six in Serie A currently have seven points. That doesn't even include Inter and Juve that are just one and two points off the pace, respectively. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's uh, it's been absolutely fascinating to see how some of these teams have started. My preseason pick was that Jose Mourinho's side, OK, wouldn't necessarily challenge for the title, but would be sort of more competitive in terms of uh, getting themselves back into the Champions League, potentially winning Coppa Italia. And I'm quite happy to see that Mourinho's pragmatism uh, is paying dividends for them so far. Uh, I think as well, it's going to be a crucial last couple of days of the transfer window for quite a few of these Italian teams. You know, we've seen Juve again, a fairly slow start start they'll be hoping obviously it's not as slow as last season but you know I get the feeling that Allegri still wants to do a lot more with this squad that probably now won't be realized in this transfer window so it's a question of perhaps making uh you know do as best they can uh you know and I, th I think Allegri's Juve 2.0 you know still is a, a work in progress yeah JJ back to you Andre chime in please I wanted to just quickly focus once again on Napoli because you know we had question marks about them uh, before the beginning of the season, obviously so much experience was leaving that squad. And, you know, even though we were seeing some potential, some promising incomings, we still were a little bit wary, right? Because of the likes of other clubs as well that were pushing. But here they are. I know it's early in the season, but they're top of Serie A. I mean, how do you feel, JJ, about Napoli and their, you know, possibility of maintaining this kind of run? They have Lecce at home next. You would presume a good home uh, win there, but you never know. I'm just wondering how good they can do it. And also... Little side note for you at the end, JJ, and Dre also chime in. Victor Osman, can he stay here? Because I'm getting a little worried about these Ronaldo narratives. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously we're going to be watching, uh, you know, very closely over the next couple of days to see if anything crops up very last minute. I'd be surprised if Napoli sanctioned a move for Ronaldo that would see Aussie men go the other way. Uh, I think Aussie men's return to, to, to form and fitness is a huge boost for them. You know, it's kind of part of the reason why they dropped off last season. You know, but also let's not forget that last campaign, you know, Napoli did start, you know, as a ha like a house on fire and then really struggled for form over the over the back half of the season. 
I mean, I think this overhaul uh, of the squad, uh, you know, that Spalletti saw happen over the summer, you know, was necessary. Obviously, some fantastic, iconic names, uh, you know, have moved on. But I think that it was the time for, for Napoli. You know, we've seen a couple of very good iterations of these Napoli sides over the last couple of years. And they've always kind of been like a nearly team, uh, you know, not quite one that's built enough, uh, you know, to 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 have sustainable success either domestically uh, or to win something in Europe either. So for me, I think that it was a necessary change for Napoli. And I think you could even argue that some players could have been moved on before. I mean, you look at how much they got for Koulibaly compared to how much he was being linked with, uh, you know, for moves away just 18 months before that. But, uh, you know, better late than never. Uh, and I think that you've uh, that Napoli will ultimately reap the benefits uh, from that. But also, you know, as, as Dre, you know, hinted earlier, Napoli haven't really been tested so much so far. I mean, okay, Fiorentina are no mugs. Uh, you know, they're a difficult team to come up against, but they're not quite sort of in that elite band of opposition just yet. So I do think to an extent the jury is still out, but it wouldn't surprise me to see Napoli maintain this kind of form uh, as long as they have Aussie men fit and firing. Because when you've got, you know, such a goal presence uh, there in your attack, uh, you know, I think that counts massively uh, in their favour. Yeah, no, no question that Osimhen is, you know, currently irreplaceable for them. They don't have another nine to, to step in. I, I don't want to entertain too much of the Cristiano Ronaldo stuff. It's a bit like fantasy Why football. Not, Andre I, 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 Why not? Let's let's get some hits. Baby. I mean, you, you, <laughs> just just when you thought you'd seen the back of him. Yeah. So if, <laughs> if it's true, if it, if it's like a hundred plus million plus the loan of Cristiano and Manchester United are um, uh, paying most of, if not all, of Cristiano's wages, uh, I drive Osimhen myself to the airport and drop him off. Uh, that's just too good. <laughs> of a deal for Napoli to, to really work out. And yes, you're mortgaging some of the future, but as, as JJ pointed out with Koulibaly, they, you know, they moved them on later on and didn't get quite as much. So if, if Osimhen is at a high now, then maybe you're more tempted to do that. Also, the, the thing, the story with Napoli this season for me has been just how quickly uh, Kvaras Helia has taken to the league. From the opening game, he's demanding the ball, he's taking players on, he's scoring goals. Um, Napoli, their numbers were a little bit inflated, I think, by the opposition in weeks one and two. But you could see that for a team that had you know, essentially four new starters, that had four massive locker room figures move on to sort of come together uh, as quickly as they did. That's a tribute to Luciano Spalletti. It tells me they're going to be fine. They're going to be in contention. And I think this is probably looking like the best Napoli we've seen since the years of Maurizio Sarri when they were contending uh, with Juve you know, late into the season and probably win uh, a Scudetto somewhere on the line if Iwani doesn't get himself sent off with four games left. Uh, <laughs> all that aside, it's a Lobotka has been magnificent for them. The addition of uh, Nombele is quite good, so the midfield continues to be solid. Um, and Giza rounding out that midfield trio. Menje is really, this almost sound, sounds blasphemous, but he's made them not miss Koulibaly early on. Now, that's a, that's a big, bold statement. Koulibaly did it for so long, uh, consistently one of the top three and often the best center back in all of Serie A, but Minji has been exceptional um, in a very small sample size so far. I think Napoli would be fun. I actually got a question for both of you guys, one each, uh, both kind of PSG related. So to Dre first, are you surprised that Napoli are looking to move on someone like Fabian Ruiz, who's been you know a key figure for Napoli over the last couple of years? I mean, I rate him I rate him as kind of one of the most underrated midfielders of the of the game in Europe, and I'm, I'm pretty excited to see him pitching up in Paris. Yeah, and I agree uh, uh, that he, especially when it comes to the final third, right, that he was the most impressive Napoli player. Once Napoli backed you up with their possession and teams started to defend deeper and deeper, having Fabian Ruiz right there on the edge of the final third, picking out passes, conducting, um, was when Napoli looked you know, really, really special. But to their credit, when he went down um, and wasn't available for long stretches last season, they didn't seem to miss him that much. And so I, I think it, it's one thing where they're either trying to lower salaries or you know they feel like they can get by without that, given what else they have in the midfield. I think... If Napoli are richer, if Napoli are more ambitious, trying to win the Champions League, they'd probably hold on to him. There's a sense also that he maybe wanted to move on to, to a new challenge, but agree that he's been fantastic for them, uh, especially when it comes to those touches in the final third. Doesn't quite, you know, track back and do some of the defensive work that some coaches might want out of their central midfielders. I think Luis uh, uh, Sarri is having a similar issue now with Luis Alberto um, at, at Lazio, where he's clearly one of the most talented players, but maybe hasn't done the sort of systemic things that the manager wants. There's an element of that with Fabian Ruiz as well, but I think he would thrive in Liga. Yeah, there's not much to add from, from you, Dre, uh, specifically. I mean, I just think when you're a club like Napoli, who's in transition, make the best out of what you can from a financial perspective and, and sell somebody like Fabian Ruiz, who, by the way, to me, just looks like one of those handsome substitute history teachers that comes in like <laughs> later in the season. So I'm, I'm excited about it. I know that you had a question, JJ. 
Yeah, well, this one's for you because I know that you're a huge fan of Keylor Navas. I mean, we've had the speculation now for a while that he might go to Napoli, might not. I mean, what sort of impact do you expect? I mean, assuming that Napoli managed to pull it off and Navas does make the move, what impact would that make on turning this Napoli side from sort of like contenders, uh, you also like, well, kind of like dark horses to like actual genuine, uh, you know, sort of title winning material or at least contending material? Yeah, no, good cue, man. I mean, listen, like, to be honest with you, my, my judgment and assessment and what I think about Kaylor Navas is not dissimilar to yours, JJ. Uh, I, I, you know, I have a, a personal attachment to Kaylor. He was one of my very first articles I wrote about, you know, when I entered the business and stuff. I, and, and he is, I think, you know, selfishly speaking, as a Latin American, hugely underrated throughout his career, despite the fact of, like, what he has done for Real Madrid, etc. I just think his global assessment of what he is as a goalkeeper is usually underrated by anybody else that doesn't fully pay attention to him. And I think Napoli can be that club where he can come in and, and sort of just not just, you know, be such a demanding figure, but he, he just e emphasizes experience, leadership, and that sort of, you know, panache that not many goalkeepers have. I, listen, I, I might as well be Kaylor Navas' agent, Drake yeah. Olera, because I'm no, just such a fan of his. Like, most, most disrespected goalkeeper of all time. One thousand like, he, he's, so, he's just so stellar. Like, granted, like Thibaut Courtois was, was an upgrade, uh, and, and it's arguably the best goalkeeper in the world right now. Uh, they bring out a very good Donnarumma to compete with him in, par in Paris. But it seems like he could never do anything like totally and completely right. They were, he always had to look over his shoulder to see who was the next person to come and take his job. And to sort of answer the question that he posed to you, um, I would say that to have that sort of winner come into that locker room would only be a huge, huge plus for, for Napoli, especially given the personalities that exited that club um, over the summer transfer window. I think bringing a guy who's won at the absolute highest level would do wonders for them. By the way, when you land in Costa Rica, he has his own runway, just him yeah. and his own exit. Okay, that's how big Kaylor Navas is. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about Monza for a second, Ray Cordero. And yeah. JJ, please chime in. I mean, their last, it's no surprise that, you know, they're struggling in the beginning. They just came back up. Uh, to Serie A, but three losses. Uh, you know, they've only scored twice, conceded eight. What are your thoughts on Monza so early in the season? Yeah, I would say that the hottest coaching seat in Serie A is probably that of uh, Giovanni Stroppa now, because um, Monza obviously have made some investments and have brought in players with Serie A experience. Um, they just uh, picked up, I believe, uh, Nicola Rovella from Juve on loan, because uh, Juve had too many midfielders at the moment. Um, we're trying to, to send some of them uh, away. They've got uh, Sensi, who's a very good sort of playmaking center midfielder uh, previously at Inter. Um, I, I like the team that they've built, but they've not yet put it together. Now, granted, I think they, they're a little bit hard done by, by the competition. And sure, they're not playing against, you know, Inter and Milan at the start of the campaign. Um, but three straight losses have all come against good teams. I think Udinese and Torino um, were two of the teams last season that played above their position in the standings. They lost to both of them. Uh, they lost 4-0 to Napoli at the Maradona Stadium, where Napoli have looked absolutely unplayable. Um, so I think it will come together for them. But the question is, will it come together early enough for Stropa to keep his job? The only two previous stints that he's had uh, in Serie A uh, managing, he was relegated uh, in both of them, most recently with Crotone in 2020, 2021, where it lasted about 24 rounds. The team ended up getting relegated anyway. Previous stint before that, he lasted only 13 rounds before he was um, fired by Pescara. So I think he's probably the, the, if you had to bet on which coach would be the first to go in Serie A, Monza would be pretty high on the list. That's really interesting to hear because I was surprised and I wasn't surprised about Thiago Motta moving on from Spezia after last season. I mean, it was very, very difficult to do better with that group of players than he did, I felt. Uh, and maybe this is the kind of opportunity that could be could be made for him. But I guess my main observation about Monza, and obviously we know the ownership set up there, it's basically, you know, AC Milan from back in the day. Uh, it kind of feels like they're, you know, utilizing a lot of their kind of old contacts. Uh, and securing the players that won't necessarily get the job done now in, in the Serie A that, that we're seeing. You know, it's a, a much different Serie A. It's not got the same style of play. Uh, you know, a lot of teams are now more youth focused, even if that's not necessarily a young domestic talent. Uh, you know, it's, it's a much more vibrant league as well. And I don't think, you know, going for like journeymen, I mean, I know the, the move didn't come off, but, but guys like Mario Icardi is not necessarily sort of the way to yeah. go and the way to be identifying your transfer targets anymore. And it kind of feels like perhaps they need to think a bit more out of the box, certainly in terms of what they might do in the winter transfer 
transfer window, wherever they might be in the league table by then, uh, in order to, to sort of turn their fortunes around. Because I think in terms of the talent they've got within the squad, it's probably enough to keep them up. I don't see them necessarily doing much more than that. But, I mean, I think because of the calibre of players that they brought in, the pressure was so much higher on them than other teams who are, you know, expect, expected to be sort of fighting a similar battle uh, for survival. JJ, very quick, and Dre as well, very quick on Umtiti to Lecce. Thoughts? I mean, he seemed so happy to arrive when he landed. You know, I, I, obviously that's uh, also existential. He was pretty much ignored at Barcelona, but now that he's at Lecce, what are your thoughts on uh, Umtiti at Lecce, JJ? I mean, I think it's it's a it's a relief to see him get another chance to relaunch his career. It's it's so sad to sort of see the way that he suffered since putting his body and his career on the line uh, for France at the World Cup four years ago. Uh, and you know, I really hope for him that it works out. It's a bit of a surprise destination, but I think that's just you know a sign of the times and how far sort of his stock has fallen through, not necessarily any fault of his own. Uh, and I think the way that he was hounded out of Barca, as has been the case with many of the players, uh, you know, is pretty is pretty disgusting and you know leaves quite a bad taste in their mouth so fingers crossed things work out for him i kind of hoped that he'd pitch up uh in ligan he was linked with ren uh, an emotional return to leon but uh you know let's say let's see if he can relaunch his career there yeah it was it was moving to see how they received him and more than anything just to see udd kind of smiling and happy feeling appreciated after uh, the way things have gone for several seasons uh he did seem to sort of bend over backwards uh, to accommodate his time at barcelona he agreed to the same amount of money spread out over more time so they could amortize uh his salary um so i, I i'm rooting for him is the best thing i could say we haven't seen a version of umtiti uh, remotely close to what his level was pre-injuries um and so maybe this is the place where he can revive his career the, the pace of city i can be a little bit slower a little bit more tactical um, and I'll be keeping it to the side because it's a guy you're genuinely rooting for and, and another um, you know, big name joining Serie A is always a good thing. 100%. Samuel Omtiti, we wish you the best at Lecce. All right, let's wrap up Serie A chatter and with Dre Cordero with a big one this weekend, uh, this Saturday, as the Milan Derby comes to town. By the way, Paramount Plus is the only place to stream every minute of every Serie A match. And you can quickly and easily sign up for your very own account right now with a free one-month trial by going to ParamountPlus.com forward slash Dre Cordero is a legend. I'm just kidding. But <laughs> it's ParamountPlus.com forward slash Italy. Just, Clive, just click the Try It Free button and use promo code Italy for instant access to the best Italian club soccer available across all of your devices. Visit ParamountPlus.com forward slash Italy and start streaming today. Let's talk about the Milan Derby, Dre Cordero. Fantastic stuff. I can't wait. It's always a good one, right? But when you look early in the season, Milan in second, they've won uh, twice, drawn uh, once, and Inter Milan have won twice and lost once. So, you know, it's still very early, a few injury notes from both sides, but what can you expect in this first Milan Derby of the season? Well, we've got a, like an absolutely brilliant um, doubleheader on Saturday where uh, Fiorentina Juventus is one of the most hated rivalries in all of Serie A, and that's just the appetizer to the Milan Derby leader in the day. Uh, Milan have been one of the most dominant teams in their own way, right? And, and dominant not in an individual sense, even though Rafael Leao and, and Mike Magnan are two brilliant individual pieces, um, but just the collective has always seemed to be stronger than, than the sum of the parts, and that's why they've gone you know, 19 in a row without a loss. Uh, their last defeat was back in January. It was a fluke loss to Spezia with some controversial officiating uh, at the end of that. Um, otherwise, they've been virtually unbeatable. They've started the season strong, not quite as strong defensively. Uh, I think in the big five European leagues in 2022, nobody has more clean sheets uh, than they do, but they have given up some goals early on in Serie A this season. De Ketelare is an absolute upgrade. Um, he's only started one game so far, but looked good coming off the bench in the first a couple of games as well. He's been that, I think, Trecuartisa, that, that missing playmaker in the center of the park uh, that they've been missing. I think you, you take out Frank Kessie, who's moved on to Barcelona, and you give uh, Ben Nasser some more playing time. That changes the dynamic of the midfield. That's a midfield that wants to have the ball more, that can be a bit more creative. Ben Nasser has been brilliant um, in the early campaign as well. And they, their one weakness, I, I think, is still the fact that the right wing position, whether it's um, Salamaker starting or Junior Messias starting, uh, it's just not at the level of the rest of that starting 11. And it doesn't seem like they're going to be able to address that. For Inter, they're, they're as, as strong and as solid uh, on paper and personnel-wise as they were two years ago when they won the Scudetto. Um, the problem is they're not significantly better than that. Other teams have gotten better. They're going to be without uh, Lukaku for the next three to probably more like four games. That includes Bayern Munich. That, that, that includes the... Um, the derby this weekend it's a big miss Edin Dzeko is quite good for them Joaquin Correa has started to pick things up uh, but there's no replacement for Lukaku who is far and away their best center forward 
Yeah, I mean, for, for me, the, the the thing that I'm really curious about in terms of the dynamic certainly with regards to AC Milan um, is how they can translate their domestic form into Europe because, uh, you know, they were a bit disappointing in the Champions League last campaign, but also at the same time, you know, they lost Simon Kier uh, at a key moment, really inopportune uh, loss that. And also it took Inter, uh, you know, a good season to sort of get back into the swing of things to be competitive in the Champions League again. And I'm wondering if we see with this sort of very dominant Milan side, do you expect them, Dre, uh, you know, to, to, to sort of be able to translate that domestic form onto the continental stage a bit better? And I know, uh, LME, I'm skipping the, the show on a little bit into, hey, the, into the European chat. But, it's uh... not me that's angry, JJ. <laughs> Des Norris is going to be... Uh... <laughs> no, I, I hear you. And I think when it comes to the Champions League, there's really no substitute for having been there before. Um, and, and it does... You know, it's, it's, there's a reason why first-time finalists don't typically win the Champions League. Those those knees start to wobble a little bit, teams get the rubber legs. Um, and so Milan, I think, is a team that has, it's very young um, and has a bit more experience this season than last. They have an, I think, accessible group, right? Uh, a way to Salisbury, they'll open up, they get uh, Dinamo Zagreb, um, Chelsea. You would think that Chelsea and Milan would be the two favorites to advance out of that group. The ones that got the brutal group were Inter, uh, Inter against Bayern Munich, against Barcelona. If, if you had to give one of the Serie A teams the most challenging group that, you know, Inter have been there before, maybe have the best experience to deal with it, but it's still, you know, quite difficult to, to expect them to, to advance, even though they played exceptionally well against Liverpool last season and maybe deserve to go through. Um, trying to replicate that against the likes of Bayern and, and a really rejuvenated Barcelona, it's going to be really tough for them. I expect Milan to go through. I think Inter may be better on the European stage and still not enough to get past that very, very difficult group. And let's not forget, by the way, that AC Milan, you know, on, on the verge of, uh, you know, dealing on their journey with new ownership, uh, with the Yankees and Main Street, part of the new ownership led by Redbird Capital, by the way, which should mm -hmm. be finalized this fall. So show, should be exciting. But this is the Champions League group. Uh, and l l let's just, I mean, well, first of all, Dre, very quickly, I know you hate doing this, or maybe you don't, I'm not sure. Give me your prediction for the uh, Derby de la Malonina. Um, I'll go Milan. I was in... Um... We did that from San Siro last, uh, last season. Uh, Olivier Giroud is absolutely brilliant. He's off to a good start as well. And so, you know, forget form, whatnot, Derby and all the cliches you want to throw around. I think Milan are just off to a better start, probably going, I mean, 19 games unbeaten. Um, don't have any major injury concerns or suspensions. And Lukaku miss is a big one for, for Inter. And so slight advantage to Rosaletti. Yeah, this is what, this one's an interesting one. I'm going to go draw, but I think that's mainly because Inter have to show a bit of a reaction after slipping to defeat. Uh, you know, Milan, I think, will be prepared to you know to to come up against a, a motivated Inter. So it wouldn't surprise me if if Milan do sneak it. Uh, I think it might be a narrow win if that's the case. But for me, I think a draw is probably uh, is probably most likely. And if Inter you know do slip to defeat, uh, you know, then I think there will start to be some questions asked about their title credentials this season if they haven't been already yeah inter are a good team obviously lautaro martinez jeco still there lukaku's absence worries me a little bit i, I feel that ac milan well, should be able well, to take this one one last thing on inter is they're, mm. they're still sort of waiting for Amri Mkhitaryan to get up to like full fitness Correct. and i think he yeah. adds another element in the midfield who's like part center midfielder part trequartista um, he can add something to that team as well especially in the absence of, uh, of lukaku no matter what it should be an exciting fixture and to dre's point is also fiorentina against uh, Juventus and so much to discuss. Uh, by the way, before signing off, uh, I wanted to remind you that there's midweek matches as well in Serie as well. Uh, Sassuolo, sexy Sassuolo against AC Milan today as we're taping 12.30 Eastern. Inter also played 2.45 against Cremonese, 2.45 Eastern and some more matches as well. So make sure that you check out Paramount Plus CBS Sports and don't forget forward slash Italy. Dre Cordero, always a pleasure, my friend. Final thoughts before you say arrivederci. Yeah, no, just a plug. Uh, join us. Uh, me and Matteo Bonetti will be on the call for Sampdoria Lazio. Um, the Marassi always provides a good atmosphere. Uh, Saturday's Lazio is a lot of fun to watch. Um, so join us on uh, Paramount Plus and CBS Sports Network on Wednesday. I love it. Matteo Bonetti, the Ed and Jekko of Paramount Plus. Uh, I <laughs> love it so much. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Dre Cordero in the house. Thank you, buddy. Take care of yourself. Cheers, guys. Always fun. Cheers, Dre. Welcome back, everybody. Que golazo here on this Tuesday LME here. Jonathan Johnson, don't worry. Don't worry, everybody. We won't even mention AVFC today, I promise you. All right, but let's talk Jonathan Johnson. Listen, JJ, I've been very busy. I've been, like, moving around. I've, I'm moving into a new apartment, whatever. I haven't paid a single attention to this insanity of a story right now with the Pogba brothers. 
Okay, I'm not even going to, literally that's it. Please explain to us, give me an explainer of what the bejesus is going on. Yeah, very murky. I mean, unfortunately, you know, every couple of years, there seems to be some crazy case like this that crops up coming out of France. And it, um, unfortunately for me, it usually falls on me to report it. So there is a piece already up on CBS that sort of details what's going on, but just sort of like a, a recap. So basically, you had this kind of like cryptic declaration on uh, social media on Saturday night from an account claiming to be uh, Paul Pogba's brother, Matthias. Now, uh, you know, Paul Pogba, uh, you know, has a, a couple of relatives is playing football, Florentine as well, who was recently at, uh, at Socho in Ligue 2. Matthias is kind of the journeyman older brother. Uh, now, according to the allegations and the to and froing on social media that happened over Sunday while I was at Parc des Princes watching PSG drawing with Monaco, uh, you basically have um, some allegations from Matthias Pogba or hints from Matthias Pogba that he has basically some dirt to dish uh, on younger brother Paul. Now, Paul, Paul Pogba has come out uh, and basically clarified that there is an investigation ongoing into a gang that's linked with former childhood friends and his older brother, Matthias, uh, and sort of gleaning from the information that, uh, you know, multiple French reports have come out with since, uh, you know, there has been an attempt to uh, to, to blackmail uh, Paul Pogba to the tune of about 13 million. Uh, and it sounds like based on the, the latest sort of uh, waves of revelations uh, that Pogba considered paying some sort of fee much, much lower than the, the fee demanded to try and satisfy them. That didn't satisfy them. And that basically prompted uh, Paul Pogba to launch a complaint um, because the intimidation hasn't just happened in France while he was back visiting family uh, back in March, uh, I believe, during the international break. Uh, it's also happened in Italy since he's rejoined Juve and in Manchester while he was still a Manchester United player. So pretty scary stuff, uh, obviously. And then you've got a lot of other crazy revelations thrown in with this mention of some sort of uh, witch doctor curse that, that Paul Pogba might have put on Kylian Mbappé which he has he has refuted and, and basically claimed that Matthias Pogba, uh, his older brother, and you know the the sort of gang that he's associated with, would use to try and tarnish his name to in order to to make him cough up some money. So all very very dodgy, uh, you know, quite crazy. And you've got a lot of people uh, chiming in now. Nantes coach uh, Antoine Comboire uh, was basically giving his backing to Paul Pogba earlier today in a press conference. You've got Noel Legrette, the the French Football Federation uh, president, coming out and saying that Didier Deschamps is going to have a big decision to make about Pogba because let's not forget it's not just this controversy that's surrounding him at the moment he's recovering from injury there's no guarantee he'll be 100% fit when the World Cup rolls around at the end of the year so yeah all very unexpected uh, and, and pretty uh, explosive uh, considering that I wasn't expecting Sunday to be that busy before the game. I'm very impressed with France. You're uh, dealing with the telenovela rhetoric of South America right now. It's incredible. You're done with the Benzema situation. And now Didier Deschamps has to figure out this thing. Let's just, final question, by the way, because you did touch on it. And obviously this is a big, again, a, a big next few months for France and the national team as the World Cup starts and everything. To your point, Pogba is not guaranteed a spot at this point, recovering from injury. So how do you envisage this? Because I'm presuming that Deschamps, the last thing he wants, especially after welcoming back Karim Benzema, he wants another, you know, uh, telenovela-esque sort of storyline to poison what could be with the French national team trying to defend their World Cup title, of course. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of ways, uh, you know, to, to look at this because, you know, let's let's be honest, France haven't been at their best since winning the World Cup in 2018. They flopped uh, at Euro 2020. I mean, all credit to Switzerland for knocking them out, but it was still pretty underwhelming from Les Bleus. Uh, you know, and there, there is a different dynamic now to this group. You've got the returning Benzema, who is, you know, expected to win the Ballon d'Or later this year. You've got a very dominant Kylian Mbappe, who is now not not just top dog at PSG, but pretty much top dog within the, the French network national team as well and you know if there is any sort of semblance of truth to, to to the accusations against Paul Pogba that there is any sort of rivalry or or bad blood between him and Mbappe you'd have to assume that that would also impact the chemistry on the group uh, and have to influence Deschamps decision as well it sounds unlikely that there is any truth to that at this stage but this is something that's changing you know sort of by the hour there's a lot of, of different things being said and it's you know it's a question of going through you know what 
you know, what is actually coming from a reliable source and what isn't because there's a lot of speculation. But I don't think it's unreasonable to say that it's going to be a big couple of months coming up for Pogba because it's not just, uh, you know, about his injury. It's not just about his poor form on the pitch because, let's be honest, he hasn't been playing uh, at a great level, hasn't obviously been able to, to be available for Juve either yet since uh, since completing his return to Turin. Uh, and, you know, this France team is going to have to move on without him at some point. It's not He's not the only player as well that uh, David is going to have headaches over. You've got the likes of Engolo Conte as well, who physically is not the same player that he was a couple of years ago. So, you know, a lot on Deschamps' plate to, to deal with. And, you know, he won't appreciate another scandal sort of coming into the camp uh, so soon after, you know, the the, the recent uh, return of Benzema and all of the, the sort of bad memories and, uh, and uh, you know, recrimination that that brought with it. The emergence of Aurelien Chomeny and Bouba Kamara, of course, is not going to help any matters for Pogba. Pog, I spot mean, Bouba Bu Bu Kamara should be captain of France at this 1, point. 1,000%. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> hey, uh, very just to finish up here uh, very quickly here, obviously, you know, I don't know him from Adam, but from everything that we've read about him and seen him in the last few years, Kylian Mbappé is also very... You know, he, he wears his heart in his sleeve. He, he's quite an emotional person, very, you know, I, you know lack of a better phrase. Uh, sensitive when it comes to just like relationships that he has with whether it's another teammate or you know a manager how do you think Mbappe is dealing with this situation right now I mean look um Mbappe is an old head on young shoulders uh you know obviously he has taken on a, a new level of responsibility at PSG since extending his contract there uh and he knows his importance within the French national team setup as well I don't think that he will jump to conclusions uh you know I do think that there is a, a fairly significant element of truth in what people like uh, Comboare are saying where uh you know it is a very difficult world to be sort of a young emerging football especially one that goes on to enjoy uh you know playing at the the absolute top level and sort of all the trappings the fame the fortune that comes with it uh you know and to that extent i think there is probably going to be a fairly sig significant backing of paul pogba from within you know the, the the circles closest to him i don't think that mbappe would would jump to, to to any conclusions about him i'm sure he'll probably want to clear the air in person if he's not been able to to do that already uh, you know, but it has also been, um, you know, quite a, a distracting start to the season for Mbappe himself, because let's not forget, he started the domestic campaign suspended. Uh, you know, then he had picked up that small injury, sort of had that little tiff with uh, Neymar about the penalties, which, by the way, uh, was completely swept under the rug when he gifted Neymar the penalty against Monaco for the equaliser over the weekend. Uh, and, you know, I think he's probably just looking to, to focus on his football. So when he gets an opportunity, I imagine perhaps even at the in next international break uh you know that he want to, to sort of clear that up for for good but i don't think he'll be reading too much into what's being written in the press at the moment i mean he he is very rarely away from the headlines uh you know and i think for for this kind of thing like i said it's changing at an hourly rate uh you know so i i don't think that he'll be you know passing any you know um quick judgment on this without speaking to to pogba all right we'll make sure that you keep your ears and eyes close to jonathan johnson on cbs sports as we continue to divulge on the latest drama surrounding Paul pogba and of course anything within the french national team let's go from france and finish up in spain in la liga where jj real betis pellegrini real betis looking fantastic as of late second in the table even on points onion goal difference and sevilla from an Andalusian perspective, not doing so well. They haven't won a game yet, lost twice, drawn once. By the way, uh, Real Betis has Real Madrid next and Sevilla has Barcelona next. So it should be interesting to see how they react to those two teams. But very quickly, JJ, Real Betis still climbing, Sevilla going the other way. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I'm not really that surprised. I mean, if you listened to me last season, you'd know that the handover of power in Seville has already happened, and Betty so uh, well and truly on top. No, I'm joking. It's uh, <laughs> it's been it's been a, a, a surprise start to the season in a bad way for Sevilla, uh, and a pleasant one for Betis because I think, like I've said a couple of times in recent weeks, the the kind of games that the, the Betis would have dropped points in last season are the ones that they've started this campaign with victories in. So to see them start, you know, this way to have a, a guy like Borja Iglesias. Uh, you know, in such fine scoring fettle, uh, you know, I think that really, uh, you know, serves them well uh, heading into this season. You look at Sevilla, I mean, th their transfer campaign seems to have been a bit up and down, obviously, 
it was always going to be very difficult to replace guys like Kunde and Diego Carlos. But then you look at some of the other moves that might happen late doors, like you've got Ajax now coming in who are interested in taking Lucas Ocampos. Uh, off of their hands, you've got uh, Adnan Yanuzai, who might uh, who might pitch up in Seville after five years with uh, Real Sociedad. So, you know, it's an interesting dynamic there. But I, I said this a couple of weeks ago, and I stand by it. I feel like Sevilla more now than ever have this kind of journeyman element to their squad. And I, I don't don't get me wrong. I think Monchi has done a fantastic job over the years. Absolutely deserves his uh, you know his reputation as one of the best sort of squad architects in uh, in the European game, if not the world. But it kind of feels like, you know, this is perhaps one of the lower ebbs, uh, certainly since his return uh, to Sevilla. We all know that he you know, had a, a brief dalliance in Italy with uh, with Roma. But for me, I think there's a lot of questions that Sevilla need to answer. Uh, I think Lopetegui must be quite frustrated that the team is perhaps not as strong as it has been during his time in charge. Uh, and it just feels like it's perhaps primed to be, you know, sort of the moment where Betis maybe get the better of them uh, this season. I mean, it's a long campaign. There's a lot uh, of football to be played, uh, you know, and a lot of things can change between now and the end of the season. But it just seems like at this moment in time, Betis, you know, comparatively with Sevilla, are just in a much more positive place. You know, they're settled. They're playing some great football under Pellegrini, who has a clear idea of what he wants in his project. They've got some of the key pieces, uh, you know, tied down for the next couple of years, uh, you know, and barring some some injuries or, you know, unexpected poor runs of form, uh, you know, they're going to be in a, in a pretty sweet position, you know, come the end of the season when, uh, you know, the trophies have to get decided. So they had the Copa del Rey success last season. Uh, I'm sure they'd love a title defence there, but I think really the ambition this season will be to break into those Champions League places because between them uh, and Atletico Madrid, I think there are a couple of teams who look sort of wobbly and on the verge of maybe falling out and also kind of linked to the the chase for getting back into the Champions League. I'm curious to see how Edinson Cavani impacts the Valencia attack and their potential to maybe get themselves back into the the higher the the, the upper tier uh, of La Liga after a couple of years away. Well, the next week and a half should be interesting as uh, Sevilla, of course, and Real Betis have interesting opponents in La Liga. We mentioned Real Betis has a Real Madrid, Sevilla has Barcelona. And then right after that, a few days later, Sevilla has Manchester City in the Champions League and Roma and Betis are in the same Europa League group as well. So, you know, their European endeavors should be interesting to follow as they continue their, you know, challenges in domestic competition. Jonathan Johnson, always a pleasure. My friend, make sure to follow JJ John underscore Legosa. Follow all his content on CBS Sports and uh, you know, it's it's never too uh, boring to uh, commentate on the European game. And we love doing the continental round us before we say goodbye. JJ, your final thoughts, my friend. Yeah, just, uh, you know, looking forward to a, an absolutely jam-packed week. Got the midweek slate and then the weekend games coming up. So, you know, lots to lo look forward to there. End of the transfer window as well. So it's it's about as busy as it can get for a, for a football journalist at, uh, at these times. I'm just hoping that Villa can, uh, you know, give us something to, to, to brighten the rest of the week. Perhaps against Arsenal, I don't know. I, honestly, it's, it's very difficult to, to get positive about Villa right now. But, you know, fingers crossed that backs to the wall, they can, uh, you know, pick up a result somewhere and take some of this early pressure off because it's it's been pretty uh, grim uh, being a Villa fan these uh, first few weeks of the season. Yeah, I'm not talking about them uh, for a while. I'm, 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 I Honestly, my phone was pinging this morning with people saying, would you take Scott Parker as like a replacement for Stephen Gerrard? I was like, I can't be having this conversation this, not not only this early in the day, but this early in the season as well. No, I'm not. I'm not making it. Anytime anybody asks me anything about AVFC on Twitter right now, I'm just replying with the Regina George uh, you know, staring at the school going mad and Mean Girls uh, video reaction right now because I, I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm going to wait a few weeks till I come back to it. But Jonathan Johnson, thank you so much. John underscore like gossip, CBS Sports, of course. And as JJ mentioned, we have so much to cover here at CBS Sports and most importantly, que golazo. You know, we can preview the transfer deadline recap, of course, Champions League and Europa League and European competition from next week as well. So much uh, alongside uh, JJ and obviously Mike Lahoud, uh, Benj and Fabrizio Romano. So much to discuss. Thank you so much, everybody. JJ, thank you, brother. Pleasure as always. Thanks for having me on, my man, and speak soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much for listening to Kegolasso, everybody. Take a minute to leave us a rating and review. 
uh, on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple Pods, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere you listen to your podcast. We're also available as video, as you know, if you're watching this on YouTube. So make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We're getting closer to 25,000 subscribers. Unbelievable. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic rest of your week. Enjoy the midweek action and see you next time. Till then, bye-bye.